to one in paradise by edgar allan poe from the world's best poetry volume two love part two read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter to one in paradise thou wast all that to me love for which my soul did pine a green isle in the sea love a fountain and a shrine all wreathed with fairy fruits and flowers and all the flowers were mine ah dream too bright to last ah starry hope that didst arise but to be overcast a voice from out the future cries on on but o'er the past dim gulf my spirit hovering lies mute motionless aghast for alas alas with me the light of life is o'er no more no more no more such language holds the solemn sea to the sands upon the shore shall bloom the thunder-blasted tree or the stricken eagle soar and all my days are trances and all my nightly dreams are where thy gray eye glances and where thy footstep gleams in what ethereal dances by what eternal streams end of poem this recording is in the public domain an old sweetheart of mine by james whitcomb riley from the world's best poetry volume two love part two read for librivox dot org by craig franklin an old sweetheart of mine as one who cons at evening or an album all alone and muses on the faces of the friends that he has known so i turn the leaves of fancy till in shadowy design i find the smiling features of an old sweetheart of mine the lamplight seems to glimmer with a flicker of surprise as i turn it low to rest me of the dazzle in my eyes and light my pipe in silence save a sigh that seems to yoke its fate with my tobacco and to vanish with the smoke tis a fragrant retrospection for the loving thoughts that start into being are like perfume from the blossoms of the heart and to dream the old dreams over is a luxury divine when my truant fancy wanders with that old sweet heart of mine though i hear beneath my study like a fluttering of wings the voices of my children and the mother as she sings i feel no twinge of conscience to deny me any theme when care has cast her anchor in the harbour of a dream in fact to speak in earnest i believe it adds a charm to spice the good a trifle with a little dust of harm for i find an extra flavour in memory's mellow wine that makes me drink the deeper to that old sweetheart of mine a face of lily beauty with a form of airy grace floats out of my tobacco as the genie from the vase and i thrill beneath the glances of a pair of azure eyes as glowing as the summer and as tender as the skies i can see the pink sunbonnet and the little checkered dress she wore when first i kissed her and she answered the caress with the written declaration that as surely as the vine grew round the stump she loved me that old sweetheart of mine and again i feel the pressure of her slender little hand as we used to talk together of the future we had planned when i should be a poet and with nothing else to do but write the tender verses that she set the music to when we should live together in a cosy little cot hid in a nest of roses with a fairy garden spot where the vines were ever fruited and the weather ever fine and the birds were ever singing for that old sweetheart of mine when i should be her lover for ever and a day and she my faithful sweetheart till the golden hair was grey and we should be so happy that when either's lips were dumb they would not smile in heaven till the other's kiss had come but ah my dream is broken by a step upon the stair and the door is softly opened and my wife is standing there yet with eagerness and rapture all my visions i resign to greet the living presence 
of that old sweetheart of mine. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Rose Aylmer by Walter Savage Landor from the world's best poetry volume two love part two read for librivox dot org by jason in panama rose aylmer ah what avails the sceptred race ah what the form divine what every virtue every grace rose aylmer all were thine rose aylmer whom these wakeful eyes may weep but never see a night of memories and of sighs I consecrate to thee. Walter Savage Landor End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Let Me Not to the Marriage of True Minds Sonnet 141 by William Shakespeare From the World's Best Poetry Volume 2 Love Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Anusha Ayer Let me not to the marriage of true minds Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love, which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose words are known, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out, even to the edge of doom. If this be error, and upon me proved, I never writ nor no man ever loved end of poem this recording is in the public domain sonnets from the portuguese by elizabeth barrett browning from the world's best poetry volume two love part two read for LibriVox.org by craig franklin anusha ayer lian yao Jason in Panama, Sonia, and Thomas Peter. Sonnets from the Portuguese. Sonnet 6. Go from me, yet I feel that I shall stand henceforward in thy shadow, never more alone upon the threshold of my door of individual life. I shall command the uses of my soul, nor lift my hand serenely in the sunshine as before, without the sense of that which I forbore thy touch upon the palm the widest land doom takes to part us leaves thy heart in mine with pulses that beat double what i do and what i dream include thee as the wine must taste of its own grapes and when i sue god for myself he hears that name of thine and sees within my eyes the tears of two sonnet fourteen if thou must love me let it be for naught except for love's sake only do not say i love her for her smile her look her way of speaking gently for a trick of thought that falls in well with mine and certes brought a sense of pleasant ease on such a day for these things in themselves beloved may be changed or change for thee and love so wrought may be unwrought so neither love me for thine own dear pities wiping my cheeks dry a creature might forget to weep who bore thy comfort long and lose thy love thereby but love me for love's sake that evermore thou mayst love on through love's eternity sonnet eighteen i never gave a lock of hair away to a man dearest except this to thee which now upon my fingers thoughtfully i ring out to the full brown length and say take it my day of youth went yesterday my hair no longer bounds to my foot's glee nor plant i it from rose or myrtle tree as girls do any more 
it only may now shade on two pale cheeks the mark of tears taught drooping from the head that hangs aside through sorrow's trick i thought the funeral shears would take this first but love is justified take it thou finding pure from all those years the kiss my mother left here when she died sonnet twenty one say over again and yet once over again that thou dost love me though the word repeated should seem a cuckoo song as thou dost treat it remember never to the hill or plain valley and wood without her cuckoo strain comes the fresh spring in all her green completed beloved i amid the darkness greeted by a doubtful spirit voice in that doubt's pain cry speak once more thou lovest who can fear too many stars though each in heaven shall roll too many flowers though each shall crown the year say thou dost love me love me love me toll the silver iterance only minding dear to love me also in silence with thy soul sonnet twenty eight my letters all dead paper mute and white and yet they seem alive and quivering against my tremulous hands which loose the string and let them drop down on my knee to-night this said he wished to have me in his sight once as a friend this fixed the day in spring to come and touch my hand a simple thing yet i wept for it this the paper's light said dear i love thee and i sank and quailed as if god's future thundered on my past this said i am thine and so its ink has paled with lying at my heart that beat too fast and this o oh love thy words have ill availed if what this said i dared repeat at last sonnet thirty five if i leave all for thee wilt thou exchange and be all to me shall i never miss home talk and blessing and the common kiss that comes to each in turn nor count it strange when i look up to drop on a new range of walls and floors another home than this nay wilt thou fill that place by me which is filled by dead eyes too tender to know change that's hardest if to conquer love has tried to conquer grief tries more is all things prove for grief indeed is love and grief beside alas i have grieved so i am hard to love yet love me wilt thou open thine heart wide and fold within the wet wings of thy dove sonnet thirty eight first time he kissed me he but only kissed the fingers of this hand wherewith i write and ever since it grew more clean and white slow to will greetings quick with its o oh, list when the angels speak a ring of amethyst i could not wear here plainer to my sight than that first kiss the second passed in height the first and sought the forehead and half missed half falling on the hair o oh, beyond mead that was the chrism of love with love's own crown with sanctifying sweetness did proceed the third upon my lips was folded down in perfect purple state since when indeed i have been proud and said my love my own sonnet thirty nine because thou hast the power and ownst the grace to look through and behind this mask of me against which ears have beat thus blanchingly with their reins and behold my soul's true face the dim and weary witness of life's race because thou hast the faith and love to see through that same soul's distracting lethargy the patient angel waiting for a place in the new heavens because nor sin nor woe nor god's infliction nor death's neighbourhood nor all which others viewing turn to go nor all which makes me tired of all self-viewed nothing repels thee dearest teach me so to pour out gratitude as thou dost good 
Sonnet 43 How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach, when feeling out of sight the ends of being and ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need, by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely, as men strive for right. I love thee purely, as they turn from praise. I love thee with a passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seem to lose in my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnets by James Russell Lowell from the world's best poetry volume two love part two read for LibriVox.org by jason in panama sonia and thomas peter sonnets my love i have no fear that thou shouldst die albeit i ask no fairer life than this whose numbering clock is still thy gentle kiss while time and peace with hands unlocked fly Yet care I not where in eternity we live and love, well knowing that there is no backward step for those who feel the bliss of faith as their most lofty yearnings high. Love hath so purified my being's core, me seems I scarcely should be startled even to find some morn that thou hadst gone before, since with thy love this knowledge too was given which each calm day doth strengthen more and more that they who love are but one step from heaven our love is not a fading earthly flower its winged seed dropped down from paradise and nursed by day and night by sun and shower doth momently to fresher beauty rise to us the leafless autumn is not bare nor winter's rattling boughs lack lusty green our summer hearts make summer's fullness where no leaf or bud or blossom may be seen for nature's life in love's deep life doth lie love whose forgetfulness is beauty's death whose mystic key these cells of thou and i into the infinite freedom openeth and makes the body stark and narrow great the wind-flung leaves of heaven's palace gate i thought her love at full that i did err joy's wreath drooped o'er mine eyes i could not see that sorrow in our happy world must be love's deepest spokesman and interpreter but as a mother feels her child first stir under her heart so felt i instantly deep in my soul another bond to thee thrill with that life we saw depart from her O oh, mother of our angel child, twice dear, death knits as well as parts, and still, I wis, her tender radiance shall enfold us here, even as the light, borne up by inward bliss, threads the void glooms of space without a fear, to print on farthest stars her pitying kiss. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. My Love by James Russell Lowell From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 2, Love, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin My Love Not as all other women are, is she that to my soul is dear. Her glorious fancies come from far beneath the silver evening star, and yet her heart is ever near. Great feelings hath she of her own, which lesser souls may never know. God giveth them to her alone, and sweet they are as any tone, wherewith the wind may choose to blow. Yet in herself she dwelleth not, although no home were half so fair, no simplest duty is forgot. Life hath no dim and lowly spot, that doth not in her sunshine share. She doeth little kindnesses, which most leave undone or despise. 
for naught that sets one's heart at ease and giveth happiness or peace is low esteemed in her eyes she hath no scorn of common things and though she seems of other birth round us her heart entwines and clings and patiently she folds her wings to tread the humble paths of earth her glorious fancies come from far and deeds of weekday holiness fall from her noiseless as the snow nor hath she ever chance to know that aught were easier than to bless she is most fair and thereunto her life doth rightly harmonize feeling or thought that was not true ne'er made less beautiful the blue unclouded heaven of her eyes she is a woman one in whom the springtime of her childish years hath never lost its fresh perfume though knowing well that life hath room for many blights and many tears i love her with a love as still as a broad river's peaceful might which by high tower and lowly mill goes wandering at its own will and yet doth ever flow aright and on its full deep rest serene like quiet isles my duties lie it flows around them and between and makes them fresh and fair and green sweet homes wherein to live and die end of poem this recording is in the public domain adam describing eve from paradise lost book eight by john milton from the world's best poetry volume two love part two read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter adam describing eve from paradise lost book eight mine eyes he closed but open left the cell of fancy my internal sight by which abstract as in a trance methought i saw though sleeping where i lay and saw the shape still glorious before whom awake i stood who stooping opened my left side and took from thence a rib with cordial spirits warm and life-blood streaming fresh wide was the wound but suddenly with flesh filled up and healed the rib he formed and fashioned with his hands under his forming hands a creature grew manlike but different sex so lovely fair that what seemed fair in all the world seemed now mean or in her summed up in her contained and in her looks which from that time infused sweetness into my heart unfelt before and into all things from her air inspired the spirit of love and amorous delight she disappeared and left me dark i waked to find her or forever to deplore her loss and other pleasures all abjure when out of hope behold her not far off such as i saw her in my dream adorned with what all earth or heaven could bestow to make her amiable on she came led by her heavenly maker though unseen and guided by his voice nor uninformed of nuptial sanctity and marriage rites grace was in all her steps heaven in her eye in every gesture dignity and love i overjoyed could not forbear aloud this turn hath made amends thou hast fulfilled thy words creator bounteous and benign giver of all things fair but fairest this of all thy gifts nor envious i now see bone of my bone flesh of my flesh myself before me woman is her name of man extracted for this cause he shall forgo father and mother and to his wife adhere and they shall be one flesh one heart one soul she heard me thus and though divinely brought yet innocence and virgin modesty her virtue and the conscience of her worth that would be wooed and not unsought be won not obvious not obtrusive but retired the more desirable or to say all nature herself though pure of sinful thought wrought in her so that seeing me she turned i followed her 
she what was honour knew and with obsequious majesty approved my pleaded reason to the nuptial bower i led her blushing like the morn all heaven and happy constellations on that hour shed their selectest influence the earth gave sign of gratulation and each hill joyous the birds fresh gales and gentle airs whispered it to the woods and from their wings flung rose flung odors from the spicy shrub disporting to the amorous bird of night sung spousal and bid haste the evening star on his hilltop to light the bridal lamp when i approach her loveliness so absolute she seems and in herself complete so well to know her own that what she wills to do or say seems wisest virtuousest discreetest best all higher knowledge in her presence falls degraded wisdom in discourse with her loses discountenanced and like folly shows authority and reason on her weight as one intended first not after made occasionally and to consummate all greatness of mind in nobleness their seat build in her loveliest and create an awe about her as a guard angelic placed neither her outside form so fair nor aught so much delights me as those graceful acts those thousand decencies that daily flow from all her words and actions mixed with love and sweet compliance which declare unfeigned union of mind or in us both one soul harmony to behold in wedded pair more grateful than harmonious sound to the ear end of poem this recording is in the public domain adam to eve from paradise lost book nine by john milton from the world's best poetry volume two love part two read for librivox dot org by jason in panama adam to eve from paradise lost book nine o fairest of creation last and best of all god's works creature in whom excelled whatever can to sight or thought be formed holy divine good amiable or sweet how art thou lost how on a sudden lost defaced deflowered and now to death devote rather how hast thou yielded to transgress the strict forbiddance how to violate the sacred fruit forbidden some cursed fraud of enemy hath beguiled thee yet unknown and me with thee hath ruined for with thee certain my resolution is to die how can i live without thee how forego thy sweet converse and love so dearly joined to live again in these wild woods forlorn should god create another eve and i another rib afford yet loss of thee would never from my heart no no i feel the link of nature draw me flesh of flesh bone of my bone thou art and from thy state mine never shall be parted bliss or woe however i with thee have fixed my lot certain to undergo like doom if death consort with thee death is to me as life so forcible within my heart i feel the bond of nature draw me to my own my own in thee for what thou art is mine our state cannot be severed we are one one flesh to lose thee were to lose myself milton End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Brutus and Portia from Julius Caesar, Act Two, Scene One, by William Shakespeare, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Two, Love, Part Two. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin as the narrator. Jason in Panama as Brutus and Lian Yao as Portia. Brutus and Portia, from Julius Caesar, Act Two, Scene One. Enter Portia. Brutus, my lord! Portia, what mean you? 
wherefore rise you now? It is not for your health thus to commit your weak condition to the raw, cold morning. Nor for yours neither. You ungently, Brutus, stole from my bed, and yesternight at supper you suddenly arose and walked about, musing and sighing with your arms across, and when I asked you what the matter was, you stared upon me with ungentle looks. I urged you further, and you scratched your head, and too impatiently stamped with your foot. Yet I insisted, yet you answered not, but with an angry wafture of your hand gave sign for me to leave you. So I did, fearing to strengthen that impatience which seemed too much enkindled, and with all hoping it was but an effect of humour, which sometimes hath his hour with every man. It will not let you eat, nor talk, nor sleep, and could it work so much upon your shape, as it hath much prevailed in your condition, I should not know you, Brutus. Dear my lord, make me acquainted with your cause of grief. I am not well in health, and that is all. Brutus is wise, and were he not in health, he would embrace the means to come by it. Why, so do I. Good Portia, go to bed. Is Brutus sick? And is it physical to walk unbraced and suck up the humours of the dank morning? What? Is Brutus sick? And will he steal out of his wholesome bed to dare the vile contagion of the night and tempt the roomy and unpurged air to add unto his sickness? No, my Brutus, you have some sick offence within your mind, which by the right and virtue of my place I ought to know of. And upon my knees I charm you by my once commended beauty by all your vows of love and that great vow which did incorporate and make us one that you unfold to me yourself your half why you are heavy and what men to-night have had resort to you for here have been some six or seven who did hide their faces even from darkness kneel not gentle portia i should not need if you were gentle brutus within the bond of marriage tell me brutus is it accepted i should know no secrets that appertain to you am i yourself but as it were in sort of limitation to keep with you at meals comfort your bed and talk to you sometimes dwell i but in the suburbs of your good pleasure if it be no more portia is brutus's harlot not his wife you are my true and honourable wife as dear to me as are the ruddy drops that visit my sad heart if this were true then should I know this secret? I grant I am a woman, but withal a woman that Lord Brutus took to wife. I grant I am a woman, but withal a woman well reputed, Cato's daughter. Think you I am no stronger than my sex, being so fathered and so husbanded? Tell me your counsels, I will not disclose them. I have made strong proof of my constancy, giving myself a voluntary wound here in the thigh, can I bear that with patience, and not my husband's secrets? O oh, ye gods, render me worthy of this noble wife. Knocking within. Hark, hark, one knocks. Portia, go in a while, and by and by thy bosom shall partake the secrets of my heart. All my engagements I will construe to thee, all the charactery of my sad brows. Leave me with haste. Exit Portia. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lord Walter's Wife by Elizabeth Barrett Browning From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 2, Love, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Anusha Ayer as the narrator Lian Yao as Lord Walter's Wife And Jason in Panama as Maud lord walter's wife but why do you go said the lady while both sate under the yew and her eyes were alive in their depth as the kraken beneath the sea blue because i fear you he answered because you are far too fair and able to strangle my soul in a mesh of your gold-coloured hair oh that she said is no reason such knots are quickly undone and too much beauty i reckon is nothing but too much sun yet farewell so he answered the sun strokes fatal at times i value your husband lord walter whose gallop rings still from the limes oh that she said is no reason 
You smell a rose through a fence. If two should smell it, what matter? Who grumbles and wears a pretense? But I, he replied, have promised another when love was free to love her alone, alone, who alone and afar loves me. Why that, she said, is no reason. Love's always free, I am told. Will you vow to be safe from the headache on Tuesday and think it will hold? But you, he replied, have a daughter, a young little child, who is laid in your lap to be pure. So I leave you. The angels would make me afraid. Oh, that, she said, is no reason. The angels keep out of the way. And Dora, the child, observes nothing, although you should please me and stay. At which he rose up in his anger. Why now you no longer are fair? Why now you no longer are fatal, but ugly and hateful, I swear? At which she laughed out in her scorn. These men, oh, these men over nice, who are shocked if a colour not virtuous is frankly put on by a vice. Her eyes blazed upon him. And you, you bring us your vices so near that we smell them. You think in our presence a thought to a defame us to hear. What a reason had you, and what right? I appeal to your soul for my life, to find me too fair as a woman. Why, sir, I am pure and a wife. Is the day star too fair up above you? It burns you not. Dare you imply I brushed you more close than the star does when water had set me as high? If a man finds a woman too fair, he means simply adapted too much to use as unlawful and fatal the praise shall i thank you for such too fair not unless you misuse us and surely if once in a while you attain to it straight away you call us no longer too fair but too vile a moment i pray your attention i have a poor word in my head i must utter though womanly custom would set it down better unsaid you grew, sir, pale to impertinence, once when I showed you a ring. You kissed my fan when I dropped it. No matter, I've broken the thing. You did me the honour, perhaps, to be moved at my side now and then. In a senses, a voice I've heard, which is common to beasts and some men. Love's a virtue for heroes, as white as the snow on high hills, and immortal as every great soul is that struggles, endures, and fulfils. I love my water profoundly. You, Maud, though you faltered a week, for the sake of, what was it, an eyebrow? Or, less still, a mole on a cheek. And since, when all said, you're too noble to stoop, to the frivolous cant, about crimes irresistible, virtues that swindle, betray, and supplant, I determined to prove to yourself that, whatever you may dream or vow, by illusion, you want precisely no more of me than you have now. There, look me full in the face, in the face, understand if you can, that the eyes of such women as I am are clean as the palm of a man. Drop his hand, you insult him, avoid us for fear we should cost you a scar, you take us for harlots, I tell you, and not for the women we are. You wrong me, but then I consider, there's water. And so, at the end, I vow that he should not be mulcted by me in the hand of a friend. Have I hurt you indeed? We are quits, then. Nay, friend of my water, be mine. Come, Dora, my darling, my angel, and help me to ask him to dine. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Paulina's Appeal from Polyupt by Pierre Corniel, translated from the French by W. F. Noakes. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 2, Love, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama as Severus. And Sonia as Paulina. Paulina's Appeal from Polyupt. I stand agaze, rooted, confounded, in sheer wonderment such blind resolve is so unparalleled i scarce may trust the witness of mine ears a heart that loves you and what heart so poor that knowing loves you not one loved of you to leave regretless so much bliss just one nay more 
as though it were a fatal prize to his corrival straight to yield it up truly or wondrous manias christians have or their self-happiness must be sans born since to attain it they will cast away what others at an empire's cost would win for me had fate a little sooner kind blessed my true service with your hand's reward the glory of your eyes had been my worship my twin kings had they reigned kings nay my gods to dust to powder had i grinded been ere i had hold let me not hear too much let not the smouldering embers of old time relume to speech unworthy of us both severus no paulina utterly his latest hour my polyuctus nears nay scarce a minute has he yet to live you all unwittingly have been the cause of this his death i know not if your thoughts their portals opening to your wishes knock have dared to some wild hope give harbouring based upon his undoing but no well no death so cruel i would not boldly front hell hath no tortures i would not endure or ever my stainless honour i would spot my hand bestowing upon any man who anywise were his death's instrument and could you for such madness deem me apt hate would replace my erstwhile tender love your generous still be so to the end my father fears you is in mood to grant all you might ask i i even dare aver that if my husband he do sacrifice twill be to you safe then your hapless victim bestir yourself stretch him your helping hand that this is much to claim of you i know but more the efforts great the more the glory to save a rival spite of rivalry were greatness all particular to you and be that not enough for your renown twere much to let a woman erst so loved and haply who may yet be somewhat dear her greatest treasure owe to your great heart in fine remember that you are severus adieu alone determine of your course for if you be not all i think you are i'd still not knowing it believe you such end of poem this recording is in the public domain the wife of loki by lady charlotte elliot from the world's best poetry volume two love part two read for librivox dot org by sonia the wife of loki cursed by the gods and crowned with shame fell father of a direful brood whose crimes have filled the heaven with flame and drenched the earth with blood loki the guileful loki stands within a rocky mountain gorge chains skirt his body feet and hands wrought in no mortal forge coiled on the rock a mighty snake above him day and night is hung with dull malignant eyes awake and poison dropping tongue drop follows drop in ceaseless flow each falling where the other fell to lay upon his blistered brow the liquid fire of hell but lo beside the howling wretch a woman stands devoid of dread and one pale arm is seen to stretch above his tortured head all through the day is lifted up and all the weary night-time through one patient hand that holds a cup to catch the poison dew sometimes the venom overfills the cup and she must pour it forth with loki's curses then the hills are rent from south to north but she in answer only sighs and lays her lips upon his face and with love's anguish in her eyes resumes her constant place End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Like a Laverock in the Lift by Jean Ingelow From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 2, Love, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Anusha Ayer Like a Laverock in the Lift It's we too it's we too for a 
all the world and we too and heaven be our stay like a laverock in the lift sing o bonny bride all the world was adam once with eve by his side what's the world my lass my love what can it do i am thine and thou art mine life is sweet and new if the world have missed the mark let it stand by for we too have gotten leave and once more will try like a laverock in the lift sing o bonny bride it's we too it's we too happy side by side take a kiss from me thy man now the song begins all is made afresh for us and the brave heart wins when the darker days come and no sun will shine thou shalt dry my tears lass and i'll dry thine it's we too it's we too while the world's away sitting by the golden sheaves on our wedding day end of poem this recording is in the public domain were i but his own wife by mary downing from the world's best poetry volume two love part two read for LibriVox.org by anusha ayer were i but his own wife were i but his own wife to guard and to guide him tis little of sorrow should fall on my dear i chant my low love verses stealing beside him so faint and so tender his heart would but hear i'd pull the wild blossoms from valley and highland and there at his feet i would lay them all down i'd sing him the songs of our poor stricken island till his heart was on fire with a love like my own there's a rose by his dwelling i'd tend the lone treasure that he might have flowers when the summer would come there's a harp in his hall i would wake its sweet measure for he must have music to brighten his home were i but his own wife to guide and to guard him tis little of sorrow should fall on my dear for every kind glance my whole life would award him in sickness i'd soothe and in sadness i'd cheer my heart is a fount welling upward for ever when i think of my true love by night or by day that heart keeps its faith like a fast-flowing river which gushes forever and sings on its way i have thoughts full of peace for his soul to repose in were i but his own wife to win and to woo oh sweet if the night of misfortune were closing to rise like the morning star darling for you end of poem this recording is in the public domain two lovers by marion evans lewis cross george eliot from the world's best poetry volume two love part two Read for LibriVox.org by Anusha Ayer. Two Lovers Two lovers by a moss-grown spring They leaned soft cheeks together there Mingled the dark and sunny hair And heard the wooing thrushes sing O oh, budding time, O oh, love's blessed prime Two wedded from the portal stepped the bells made happy carolings the air was soft as fanning wings white petals on the pathway slept o oh, pure-eyed bride o oh, tender pride two faces o'er a cradle bent two hands above the head were locked these pressed each other while they rocked those watched a life that love had sent o oh, solemn hour o oh, hidden power two parents by the evening fire the red light fell about their knees on heads that rose by slow degrees like buds upon the lily spire o oh, patient life o oh, tender strife 
the two still sat together there the red light shone about their knees but all the heads by slow degrees had gone and left that lonely pair o oh, voyage fast o oh, vanished past the red light shone upon the floor and made the space between them wide they drew their chairs up side by side their pale cheeks joined and said once more o oh, memories o oh, past that is end of poem this recording is in the public domain in twos by william channing gannett from the world's best poetry volume two love part two read for librivox dot org by jason in panama in twos somewhere in the world there hide garden gates that no one sees save they come in happy twos not in one nor yet in threes but from every maiden's door leads a pathway straight and true map and survey know it not he who finds finds room for two then they see the garden gates never skies so blue as theirs never flowers so many sweet as for those who come in pairs round and round the alleys wind now a cradle bars the way now a little mound behind so the two go through the day when no nook in all the lanes but has heard a song or sigh lo another garden gate opens as the two go by in they wander knowing not five and twenty fills the air with a silvery echo low all about the startled pair happier yet these garden walks closer heart to heart they lean stiller softer falls the light few the twos and far between till at last as on they pass down the paths so well they know once again at hidden gates stand the two they enter slow golden gates of fifty years may our two your latchet press garden of the sunset land hold their dearest happiness then a quiet walk again then a wicket in the wall then one stepping on alone then two at the heart of all william channing gannett end of poem this recording is in the public domain hebrew wedding from the fall of jerusalem by henry hart millman from the world's best poetry volume two love part two read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter hebrew wedding from the fall of jerusalem to the sound of timbrel sweet moving slow our solemn feet we have borne thee on the road to the virgin's blessed abode with thy yellow torches gleaming and thy scarlet mantle streaming and the canopy above swaying as we slowly move thou hast left the joyous feast and the mirth and wine has ceased and now we set thee down before the jealously unclosing door that the favored youth admits where the veiled virgin sits in the bliss of maiden fear waiting our soft tread to hear and the music's brisker din at the bridegroom's entering in entering in a welcome guest to the chamber of his rest chorus of maidens now the jocund song is thine bride of david's kingly line how thy dove-like bosom trembleth and thy shrouded eye resembleth violets when the dews of eve a moist and tremulous glitter leave on the bashful sealed lid close within the bride veil hid motionless thou sitst and mute save that at the soft salute of each entering maiden friend thou dost rise and softly bend hark a brisker merrier glee the door unfolds tis he tis he thus we lift our lamps to meet him thus we touch our lutes to greet him 
thou shalt give a fonder meeting thou shalt give a tenderer greeting end of poem this recording is in the public domain the wedding day from epithalamian by edmund spencer from the world's best poetry volume two love part two read for librivox dot org by craig franklin the wedding day now is my love already forth to come let all the virgins therefore well await and ye fresh boys that tend upon her groom prepare yourself for he is coming straight set all your things in seemly good array fit for so joyful day the joyfullest day that ever sun did see fair sun show forth thy favourable ray and let thy life for heat not fervent be for fear of burning her sunshiny face her beauty to disgrace o fairest phoebus father of the muse if ever i did honour thee aright or sing the thing that mote thy mind delight do not thy servant's simple boon refuse but let this day let this one day be mine let all the rest be thine then i thy sovereign praises loud will sing that all the woods shall answer and their echo ring lo where she comes along with portly pace like phoebe from her chamber of the east arising forth to run her mighty race clad all in white that seems a virgin best so well it her beseems that ye would wean some angel she had been her long loose yellow locks like golden rye sprinkled with pearl and pearling flowers atween doe-like a golden mantle her attire and being crowned with a garland green seemed like some maiden queen her modest eyes abashed to behold so many gazers as on her do stare upon the lowly ground a fixed are nay dare lift up her countenance too bold but blush to hear her praises sung so loud so far from being proud Nevertheless, do ye still loud her praises sing that all the woods may answer and your echo ring tell me ye merchant daughters did ye see so fair a creature in your town before so sweet so lovely and so mild as she adorned with beauty's grace and virtue's store her goodly eyes like sapphire shining bright her forehead ivory white her cheeks like apples which the sun hath ruddied her lips like cherries charming men to bite her breast like to a bowl of cream uncrudded her paps like lilies budded her snowy neck like to a marble tower and all her body like a palace fair ascending up with many a stately stair to honour's seat and chastity's sweet bower why stand ye still ye virgins in amaze upon her so to gaze whilst ye forget your former lay to sing to which the woods did answer and your echo ring but if ye saw that which no eyes can see the inward beauty of her lively sprite garnished with heavenly gifts of high degree much more then would ye wonder at that sight and stand astonished like to those which read medusa's mazeful head there dwell sweet love and constant chastity unspotted faith and comely womanhood regard of honour and mild modesty their virtue reigns as queen in royal throne and giveth laws alone the which the base affections do obey and yield their services unto her will nay thought of things uncommonly ever may thereto approach to tempt her mind to ill had she once seen these her celestial treasures and unrevealed pleasures then would ye wonder and her praises sing that all the woods should answer and your echo ring behold whilst she before the altar stands hearing the holy priest that to her speaks and blesseth her with his two happy hands how the red roses flush up in her cheeks and the pure snow with goodly vermil stain like crimson dyed in grain 
that even the angels which continually about the sacred altar do remain forget their service and about her fly oft peeping in her face that seems more f- more they on it stare but her sad eyes still fastened on the ground are governed with goodly modesty that suffers not one look to glance awry which may let in a little thought and sowed why blush ye love to give to me your hand the pledge of all our band sing ye sweet angels alleluia sing that all the woods may answer and your echo ring now all is done bring home the bride again bring home the triumph of our victory bring home with you the glory of her gain with joyance bring her and with jollity never had man more joyful day than this whom heaven would heap with bliss make feast therefore now all this live long day this day for ever to me holy is end of poem this recording is in the public domain the bride from a ballad upon a wedding by sir john suckling from the world's best poetry volume two love part two read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter the bride from a ballad upon a wedding the maid and thereby hangs a tale for such a maid no witson ale could ever yet produce no grape that's kindly ripe could be so round so plump so soft as she nor half so full of juice her finger was so small the ring would not stay on which they did bring it was too wide a peck and to say truth for out it must it looked like the great collar just about our young colt's neck her feet beneath her petticoat like little mice stole in and out as if they feared the light but oh she dances such a way no sun upon an easter day is half so fine a sight her cheek so rare a white was on no daisy makes comparison who sees them is undone for streaks of red were mingled there such as are on a catherine pear the sigh that's next the sun her lips were red and one was thin compared to that was next her chin some bee had stung it newly but dick her eyes so guard her face i durst no more upon them gaze than on the sun in july her mouth so small when she does speak thou'd swear her teeth her words did break that they might passage get but she so handled still the matter they came as good as ours or better and are not spent a wit end of poem this recording is in the public domain song from an old song wooed and married in awe by joanna bailey from the world's best poetry volume two love part two read for librivox dot org by jason in panama as the narrator sonia as the mother craig franklin as the father and thomas peter as the bridegroom song from an old song wooed and married in awe the bride she is winsome and bonny her hair it is snooded so sleek and faithful and kind is her johnny yet fast for the tears in her cheek no parlins are cause for her sorrow no parlins and plenishing too the bride that is ah to borrow has e'en right mickle ado wooed and married and ah wooed and married and ah is na she very wee laugh to be wooed and married at all her mither then hastily spak the lassie is glike it with pride in my pouch i had never a plaque on the day when i was bride even tack to ye wheel and be clever and draw out your thread in the sun the gear that is gifted it never will last like the gear that is won wooed and married and all with heavens and torture so small i think ye are very well off to be wooed and married at all toot toot quo her grey-headed father 
she's less a bride than a bairn she's tint like a coot frae the heather with sense and discretion to learn half husband i trow and half daddy as humour inconstantly leans the chiel maun be patient and steady that yokes wi a mate in her teens a kerchief so douce and so neat o her locks that the wind used to blow i'm baith like to laugh and to greet when i think of her married at all then out spak the wily bridegroom weel wild were his wordies i ween i'm rich though my coffer be too with the blinks o your bonny blue een i'm prouder o thee by my side though thy ruffles or ribbons be few than if kate or the croft were my bride where purfles and perlins anew dear and dearest of ony ye're wood and break it nay and do ye think scorn o your johnny and grieve to be married at day she turned and she blushed and she smiled and she looked so bashfully down the pride o her heart was beguiled and she played with his sleeves o her gown she twirled the tag o her lace and she nippet her body so blue sign blanket so sweet in his face and daft like a mawkin she flew wooed and married and ah with johnny who to ruse her and ah she thinks herself very weel off to be wooed and married at ah end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Newly Wedded by Winthrop Mackworth Pred From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 2, Love, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Newly Wedded Now the rite is duly done, now the word is spoken, And the spell has made us one, which may never be broken. Rest we, dearest, in our home, roam we over the heather, We shall rest, and we shall roam, shall we not together from this hour the summer rose sweeter breathe to charm us from this hour the winter snows lighter fall to harm us fair or foul on land or sea come the wind or weather best and worst whatever they be we shall share together death who friend from friend can part brother rend from brother shall but link us heart and heart closer to each other we will call his anger play deem his dart a feather when we meet him on our way hand in hand together end of poem this recording is in the public domain the poet's bridal day song by alan cunningham from the world's best poetry volume two love part two read for librivox dot org by jason in panama the poet's bridal day song o oh, my love's like the steadfast sun or streams that deepen as they run nor hoary hairs nor forty years nor moments between sighs and tears nor nights of thought nor days of pain nor dreams of glory dreamed in vain nor mirth nor sweetest song that flows to sober joys and soften woes can make my heart or fancy flee one moment my sweet wife from thee even while i muse i see thee sit in maiden bloom and matron wit fair gentle as when first i sued ye seem but of sedater mood Yet my heart leaps as fond for thee as when, beneath Arbiglend tree, we stayed and wooed, and thought the moon set on the sea an hour too soon, or lingered mid the falling dew, when looks were fond and words were few. Though I see smiling at thy feet five sons and thy fair daughter sweet, and time and care and birth-time woes have dimmed thine eye and touched thy rose, to thee and thoughts of thee belong whate'er charms me in tale or song. When words descend like dews, unsought, with gleams of deep enthusiast thought, and fancy in her heaven flies free, they come, my love, 
they come from thee. O, oh, when more thought we gave of old to silver than some give to gold, T'was sweet to sit and ponder o'er how we should deck our humble bower. T'was sweet to pull in hope with thee the golden fruit of fortune's tree, And sweeter still to choose and twine a garland for that brow of thine. A song wreath which may grace my jean, while rivers flow and woods grow green. At times there come, as come there ought, grave moments of sedater thought. When fortune frowns, nor lends our night one gleam of her inconstant light, and hope that decks the peasant's bower shines like a rainbow through the shower, oh, then I see while seated nigh a mother's heart shine in thine eye, and proud resolve and purpose meek speak of thee more than words can speak. I think this wedded wife of mine the best of all that's not divine. Alan Cunningham End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Thou hast sworn by thy God, my genie. By Alan Cunningham. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 2, Love, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. Thou hast sworn by thy God, my genie. Thou hast sworn by thy God, my genie, by that pretty white hand of thine, and by all the glowing stars in heaven, that thou would I be mine. And I have sworn by my God, my genie, and by that kind heart of thine, by all the stars hung thick o'er heaven, that thou shalt I be mine. Then fell for the hands that would loose sick bands, and the heart that would part sick love, but there's nae hand can loose the band, but the finger of God above. Though the wee wee cot mourn be my build, and my clothing ne'er say mean, I would lap me up rich i' the foes o' love, heaven's armful of my jean. Her white arm would be a pillow to me, for softer than the dune, and love would winnow o'er us his kind, kind wings, and sweetly I'd sleep and sound. Come here to me, thou lass of my love. Come here and kneel with me. The morn is full of the presence of God, and I cannot pray without thee. The morn wind is sweet among the beds and new flowers. The wee birds sing kindly and high. Our good man leans o'er his kale-yard dyke, and a blithe old body is he. The book morn be tame where the cow comes him, with the holy psalmody. And thou won't speak of me to thy God, and I will speak of thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Possession by Bayard Taylor From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 2 Love, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org By Thomas Peter Possession it was our wedding day a month ago, dear heart, I hear you say. If months or years or ages since have passed, I know not. I have ceased to question time. I only know that once there pealed a chime of joyous bells, and then I held you fast, and all stood back, and none my right denied. And forth we walked. The world was free and wide before us. Since that day I count my life. The past is washed away. It was no dream, that vow. It was a voice that woke me from a dream. A happy dream, I think. But I am waking now, and drink the splendor of a sun supreme that turns the mist of former tears to gold. With these arms I hold the fleeting promise, chased so long in vain. Ah, weary bird, thou wilt not fly again. Thy wings are clipped, thou canst no more depart. Thy nest is builded in my heart. I was the crescent, thou the silver phantom of the perfect sphere, held in its bosom. In one glory now our lives united shine, and many a year. 
not the sweet moon of bridal only we one lustre ever at the full shall be one pure and rounded light one planet whole one life developed one completed soul for i in thee and thou in me unite our cloven halves of destiny god knew his chosen time he bade me slowly ripen to my prime and from my boughs withheld the promised fruit till storm and sun gave vigor to the root secure o love secure thy blessing is i have thee day and night thou art become my blood my life my light god's mercy thou and therefore shalt endure end of poem this recording is in the public domain my ain wife by alexander lang from the world's best poetry volume two love part two read for LibriVox.org by craig franklin my ain wife i wouldn't have give my ain wife for any wife i see i wouldn't have give my ain wife for any wife i see a bonnier yet i've never seen a better can i be i wouldn't have give my ain wife for any wife i see oh cuddy is my ingle cheek and cheery is my jean i never see her angry look nor her her word on ain she's good wi other neighbours rune and i good wi me i wouldna give my ain wife for any wife i see and o'er oh, her looks say kindly they melt my heart outright when o'er oh, the baby's at her breast she hangs with fond delight she looks until its bonny face and sin looks to me i wouldna give my ain wife for any wife i see end of poem this recording is in the public domain my wife's a winsome wee thing by robert burns from the world's best poetry volume two love part two read for librivox dot org by jason in panama my wife's a winsome wee thing she is a winsome wee thing she is a handsome wee thing she is a bonny wee thing this sweet wee wife o mine i never saw a fairer i never loved a dearer and nest my heart i'll wear her for fear my jewel tine she is a winsome wee thing she is a handsome wee thing she is a bonny wee thing the sweet wee wife o mine the warld's rack we share it the rassel and the carrot where i'll blithely bear it and think my lot divine robert burns end of poem this recording is in the public domain the poet's song to his wife by brian waller proctor from the world's best poetry volume two love part two read for LibriVox.org by Lian Ya. The Poet's Song to His Wife How many summers, love, have I been thine? How many days, thou dove, hast thou been mine? Time, like the winged wind, went bends the flowers, hath left no mark behind to count the hours. Some weight of thought, though loath, on thee he leaves, some lines of care round both perhaps he weaves some fears a soft regret for joys scarce known sweet looks we half forget all else is flown ah with what thankless heart i mourn and sing look where our children start like sudden spring with tongues all sweet and low like a pleasant rhyme they tell how much i owe to thee and time End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Day Returns, My Bosom Burns by Robert Burns From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 2 Love, Part 2 
Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The day returns, my bosom burns. The day returns, my bosom burns. The blissful day we twa did meet. The winter wild and tempest toiled. Near summer sun was half so sweet. Then ah, the pride that loads the tide, and crosses o'er the sultry line. Then kingly robes and crowns and globes. Heaven give me more. It made thee mine. Well, day and night can bring delight, or nature aught of pleasure give, while joys above my mind can move. For thee and thee alone I live. When that grim foe of life below comes in between to make us part, the iron hand that breaks our band, it breaks my bliss, it breaks my heart. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. She was a phantom of delight by William Wordsworth From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 2, Love, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Anusha Ayer She was a phantom of delight she was a phantom of delight when first she gleamed upon my sight a lovely apparition sent to be a moment's ornament her eyes as stars of twilight fair like twilight's too her dusky hair but all things else about her drawn from maytime and the cheerful dawn a dancing shape an image gay to haunt to startle and waylay i saw her upon nearer view a spirit yet a woman too her household motions light and free and steps of virgin liberty a countenance in which did meet sweet records promises as sweet a creature not too bright or good for human nature's daily food for transient sorrows simple wiles praise blame love kisses tears and smiles and now i see with eye serene the very pulse of the machine a being breathing thoughtful breath a traveller between life and death the reason firm the temperate will endurance foresight strength and skill a perfect woman nobly planned to warn to comfort and command and yet a spirit still and bright with something of an angel light end of poem this recording is in the public domain possession by robert bulwer lytton owen meredith from the world's best poetry volume two Love, Part Two, read for LibriVox.org by Anusha Ayer as the narrator, Thomas Peter as the poet, and Lian Yao as the star. Possession. A poet loved a star, and to it whispered nightly, "Being so fair, why art thou love so far, or why so coldly shine, who shines so brightly?" O oh, beauty wooed and unpossessed, O oh, might I to this beating breast But clasp thee once and then die blessed. That star, her poet's love, So wildly warm, made human, And leaving, for his sake, her heaven above, His star stooped earthward and became a woman. Thou who hast wooed and hast possessed, My lover, answer, which was best? the star's beam or the women's breast i miss from heaven the man replied a light that drew my spirit to it and to the man the woman sighed i miss from earth a poet end of poem this recording is in the public domain my heart is a lute by lady lindsay from the world's best poetry Volume Two, Love, Part Two, read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. My heart is a lute. Alas. 
thus that my heart is a lute whereon you have learned to play for a many years it was mute until one summer's day you took it and touched it and made it thrill and it thrills and throbs and quivers still i had known you dear so long yet my heart did not tell me why it should burst one morn into song and waked new life with a cry like a babe that sees the light of the sun and for whom this great world has just begun your loot is enshrined cased in kept close with love's magic key so no hand but yours can win and wake it to minstrelsy yet leave it not silent too long nor alone lest the string should break and the music be done end of poem this recording is in the public domain reunited love by richard doddridge blackmore from the world's best poetry volume two love part two read for LibriVox.org by craig franklin as the man and sonia as the woman reunited love i dreamed that we were lovers still as tender as we used to be when i brought you the daffodil and you looked up and smiled at me true sweethearts were we then indeed when youth was budding into bloom and now the flowers are gone to seed and breezes have left no perfume because you ever ever will take such a crooked view of things distorting this and that until confusion ends in cavillings because you never never will perceive the force of what i say as if i always reasoned ill enough to take one's breath away but what if riper love replace the vision that enchanted me when all you did was perfect grace and all you said was melody and what if loyal heart renew the image never quite foregone combining as of yore in you a samson and a solomon then to the breezes will i toss the straws we split with temper's loss then seal upon your lips anew the peace that gentle hearts ensue oh welcome then your playful ways and sunshine of the early days and banish to the clouds above dull reason that be darkens love end of poem this recording is in the public domain a woman's complaint by anonymous from the world's best poetry volume two love part two read for LibriVox.org by lian yao a woman's complaint i know that deep within your heart of hearts you hold me shrined apart from common things and that my step my voice can bring to you a gladness that no other presence brings and yet dear love through all the weary days you never speak one word of tenderness nor stroke my hair nor softly clasp my hand within your own and loving mute caress you think perhaps i should be all content to know so well the loving place i hold within your life and so you do not dream how much i long to hear the story told you cannot know when we two sit alone and tranquil thoughts within your mind are stirred my heart is crying like a tired child for one fond look one gentle loving word it may be when your eyes look into mine you only say how dear she is to me oh could i read it in your softened glance how radiant this plain old world would be perhaps sometimes you breathe a secret prayer that choicest blessings unto me be given but if you said aloud god bless thee dear i should not ask a greater boon from heaven i weary sometimes of the rugged way but should you say through thee my life is sweet the dreariest desert that our path could cross would suddenly grow green beneath my feet tis not the boundless waters ocean holds that give refreshment to the thirsty flowers but just the drops that rising to the skies from thence descend in softly falling showers what matter that our granaries are filled with all the richest harvests golden stores 
if we who own them cannot enter in, but famished stand before the close-barred doors. And so tis sad that those who should be rich in that true love that crowns our earthly lot go praying with white lips from day to day for love's sweet tokens and receive them not. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Love Lightens Labour by Anonymous From the World's Best Poetry Volume 2 Love Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Anusha Ayer as the narrator Sonia as Jenny the wife Jason in Panama as the farmer And Lian Yao as the children Love Lightens Labour A good wife rose from her bed one morn And thought with a nervous dread of the piles of clothes to be washed and more than a dozen mouths to be fed there's the meals to get for the men in the field and the children to fix away to school and the milk to be skimmed and churned and all to be done this day it had rained in the night and all the wood was wet as it could be there were puddings and pies to bake besides a lot of cake for tea and the day was hot and her aching head throbbed wearily as she said if maidens but knew what good wives know they would not be in haste to wed jenny what do you think i told ben brown called the farmer from the well and a flush crept up to his bronzed brow and his eyes half bashfully fell it was this he said and coming near he smiled and stooping down kissed her cheek twas this that you were the best and the dearest wife in town the farmer went back to the field and the wife in a smiling absent way sang snatches of tender little songs she'd not sung for many a day and the pain in her head was gone and the clothes were white as the foam of the sea her bread was light and her butter was sweet and as golden as it could be just think the children all called in a breath tom wood has run off to sea he wouldn't i know if he'd only had as happy a home as we the night came down and the good wife smiled to herself as she softly said tis so sweet to labour for those we love it's not strange that maids will wed end of poem this recording is in the public domain Connubial Life From the Seasons Spring by James Thompson From the World's Best Poetry Volume two Love Part two Read for Librivox .org by Craig Franklin Connubial Life But happy they, the happiest of their kind, whom gentler stars unite and in one fate their hearts, their fortunes, and their beings blend. Tis not the coarser tie of human laws, and natural oft and foreign to the mind, that binds their peace, but harmony itself, attuning all their passions into love, where friendship full exerts her softest power, perfect esteem enlivened by desire. Ineffable and sympathy of soul, thought meeting thought and will preventing will, with boundless confidence for naught but love, can answer love and render bliss secure. Meantime a smiling offspring rises round and mingles both their graces by degrees. The human blossom blows and every day, soft as it rolls along, shows some new charm. The father's lustre and the mother's bloom, then infant reason grows apace and calls for the kind hand of an assiduous care. Delightful task to rear the tender thought, to teach the young idea how to shoot, to pour the fresh instruction o'er the mind, to breathe the enlivening spirit, and to fix the generous purpose in the glowing breast. O oh, speak the joy ye whom the sudden fear surprises often while you look around, and nothing strikes your eye but sights of bliss, all various nature pressing on the heart, all elegant sufficiency content. Retirement, rural, quiet, friendship's books, 
ease, an alternate labour, useful life. Progressive virtue, an approving heaven, these are the matchless joys of virtuous love, and thus their moments fly, the seasons thus, as ceaseless round a jarring world they roll, still find them happy, and consenting spring sheds her own rosy garlands on their heads, till evening comes, at last serene and mild, when after the long vernal day of life, enamoured more as more remembrance swells, with many a proof of recollected love, together down they sink in social sleep, together freed, their gentle spirits fly, to scenes where love and bliss immortal reign. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Retort by George Pope Morris From the World's Best Poetry Volume 2 Love Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Anusha Ayer as the narrator Craig Franklin as Old Birch And Lian Yao as Kate The Retort Old Birch, who taught the village school, Wedded a maid of homespun habit, he was as stubborn as a mule, and she as playful as a rabbit. Poor Kate had scarce become a wife before her husband sought to make her the pink of country polished life and prim and formal as a Quaker. One day the tutor went abroad, and simple Katie sadly missed him. When he returned, Behind her lord she shyly stole and fondly kissed him. The husband's anger rose, and red and white his face alternate grew. Less freedom, ma'am. Kate sighed and said, Oh dear, I didn't know it was you. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Eggs and the Horses, a Matrimonial Epic, by Anonymous. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 2, Love, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org, by Sonia as the narrator. Jason in Panama as John Dobbins. Anusha Ayer as Mary Truman, the Angry Woman, and the Servant. Craig Franklin as Mary's Father. Lian Yao as the Lady. And Thomas Peter as the Husband. The Eggs and the Horses. A matrimonial epic. John Dobbins was so captivated by Mary Truman's fortune, face, and cap, with near two thousand pounds the hook was baited, that in he popped to matrimony's trap. One small ingredient towards happiness, it seems, never occupied a single thought, for his accomplished bride, appearing well supplied with the three charms of riches, beauty, dress, he did not, as he ought, think of aught else, so no inquiry made he as to the temper of the lady. And here was certainly a great omission. None should accept of Hymen's gentle fetter, for worse or better, whatever be their prospect or condition, without acquaintance with each other's nature. For many a mild and quiet creature of charming disposition, alas, by thoughtless marriage has destroyed it. So take advice, let girls dress ever so tastily, don't enter into wedlock hastily, unless you can't avoid it. Week followed week, and, it must be confessed, the bridegroom and the bride had both been blessed. Month after month had languidly transpired, both parties became tired. Year after year dragged on, their happiness was gone ah foolish pair bear and forbear should be the rule for married folks to take but blind mankind poor discontented elves too often make the misery of themselves at length the husband said this will not do mary i never will be ruled by you so wife do you see to live together as we can't agree suppose we part with woman's pride, Mary replied, With all my heart. John Dobbins then to Mary's father goes, 
and gives the list of his imagined woes dear son-in-law the father said i see all is quite true that you've been telling me yet there in marriage is such strange fatality that when as much of life you shall have seen as it has been my lot to see i think you'll own your wife as good or better than the generality an interest in your case i really take and therefore gladly this agreement make an hundred eggs within this basket lie with which your luck to-morrow you shall try also my five best horses with my cart and from the farm at dawn you shall depart all round the country go and be particular i beg where husbands rule a horse bestow but where the wives an egg and if the horses go before the eggs i'll ease you of your wife i will if eggs away the married man departed brisk and light-hearted not doubting that of course the first five houses each would take a horse at the first house he knocked he felt a little shocked to hear a female voice with angry roar scream out hello who's there below why husband are you deaf go to the door see who it is i beg our poor friend john trudged quickly on but first laid at the door an egg i will not all this journey through the discontented traveller pursue suffice it here to say that when his first day's task was nearly done he'd seen an hundred husbands minus one and eggs just ninety-nine had given away ha there's a house where he i seek must dwell at length cried john i'll go and ring the bell the servant came john asked him pray friend is your master in the way no said the man with smiling fizz my master is not but my mistress is walk in that parlour sir my lady's in it master will be himself there in a minute the lady said her husband then was dressing and if his business was not very pressing she would prefer that he should wait until his toilet was completed adding pray sir be seated madam i will said john with great politeness but i own that you alone can tell me all i wish to know will you do so pardon my rudeness and just have the goodness a wager to decide to tell me do who governs in this house your spouse or you sir said the lady with a doubting nod your question is very odd but as i think none ought to be ashamed to do their duty do you see on that account i scruple not to say it always is my pleasure to obey but here's my husband always sad without me take not my word but ask him if you doubt me sir said the husband tis most true i promise you a more obedient kind and gentle woman does not exist give us your fist said john and as the case is something more than common allow me to present you with a beast worth fifty guineas at the very least there's smiler sir a beauty you must own there's prince that handsome black ball the grey mare and saladin the roan besides old dun come sir choose one but take advice from me let prince be he why sir you'll look the hero on his back i'll take the black and thank you too nay husband that will never do you know you've often heard me say how much i long to have a grey and this one will exactly do for me no no said he friend take the four others back and only leave the black nay husband i declare i must have the grey mare adding with gentle force the grey mare is i'm sure the better horse well if it must be so good sir the grey mare we prefer so we accept your gift john made a leg allow me to present you with an egg tis my last egg remaining the cause of my regaining i trust the fond affection of my wife whom i will love the better all my life home to content has her kind father brought me i thank him for the lesson he has taught me 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Woman's Will, an epigram by John Godfrey Sachs. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 2, Love, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Anusha Ayer. Woman's Will, an epigram. Men, dying, make their wills, but wives escape a work so sad. Why should they make what all their lives the gentle dames have had? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Worn Wedding Ring by William Cox Bennett From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 2, Love, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama The Worn Wedding Ring Your wedding ring wears thin, dear wife. Ah, summer's not a few. Since I put it on your finger first, have passed o'er me and you. And love what changes we have seen, what cares and pleasures too since you became my own dear wife when this old ring was new o oh, blessings on that happy day the happiest of my life when thanks to god your low sweet yes made you my loving wife your heart will say the same i know that day's as dear to you that day that made me yours dear wife when this old ring was new how well do i remember now your young sweet face that day how fair you were how dear you were my tongue could hardly say nor how i doted on you oh how proud i was of you but did i love you more than now when this old ring was new no 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 fairer were you then than at this hour to me and dear is life to me this day how could you dearer be as sweet your face might be that day as now it is it's true but did I know your heart as well when this old ring was new? O oh, partner of my gladness, wife, what care, what grief is there? For me you would not bravely face, with me you would not share? O oh, what a weary want had every day, if wanting you, wanting the love that God made mine when this old ring was new. Years bring fresh links to bind us, wife, young voices that are here young faces round our fire that make their mothers yet more dear young loving hearts your care each day makes yet more like to you more like the loving heart made mine when this old ring was new and blessed be god all he has given are with us yet around our table every precious life lent to us still is found though cares we've known with hopeful hearts the worst we've struggled through blessed be his name for all his love since this old ring was new the past is dear its sweetness still our memories treasure yet the griefs we've borne together borne we would not now forget whatever wife the future brings heart unto heart still true we'll share as we have shared all else since this old ring was new and if god spare us mongst our sons and daughters to grow old we know his goodness will not let your heart or mine grow cold. Your aged eyes will see in mine all they've still shown to you, and mine and yours all they have seen since this old ring was new. And oh, when death shall come at last to bid me to my rest, may I die looking in those eyes and resting on that breast. Oh, may my parting gaze be blessed with the dear sight of you, of those fond eyes fond as they were when this old ring was new william cox bennett end of poem this recording is in the public domain if thou wert by my side my love by reginald heber from the world's best poetry volume two love part two read for LibriVox .org by thomas peter if thou wert by my side, my love, lines written to his wife, while on a visit to Upper India. If thou wert by my side, my love, how fast would evening fail, in green Bengala's palmy grove, listening the nightingale. 
If thou, my love, wert by my side, my baby's at my knee, how gaily would our pinnace glide or a Ganga's mimic sea! I miss thee at the dawning grey, when, on our deck reclined, in careless ease my limbs I lay and woo the cooler wind. I miss thee when by Ganga's stream my twilight steps I guide, but most beneath the lamp's pale beam I miss thee from my side. I spread my books, my pencil try, the lingering noon to cheer, but miss thy kind approving eye, thy meek attentive ear. But when at morn and eve the star beholds me on my knee, I feel, though thou art distant far, thy prayers ascend for me. Then on, then on, where duty leads, my course be onward still, or broad Hindustan's sultry meads, or bleak Elmora's hill. That course nor Delhi's kingly gates, nor mild Malwa detain, for sweet the bliss us both awaits by yonder western main. Thy towers, Bombay, gleam bright, they say, across the dark blue sea, but never were hearts so light and gay as then shall meet in thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. There's Nay Luck About the House by Jean Adam from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 2, Love, Part 2, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. There's nae luck about the house. And are you sure the news is true? And are you sure it's will? Is this the time to think of Arky jostling by your wheel? Is this the time to think of Arky when Collins at the door? Give me my cloak to the key and see him come ashore. For there's nae luck about the house, there's nae luck of all. There's little pleasure in the house when our good man's a war. Rise up and make a clean for sight, put on the muckle pot, gee little cater cotton gown and jockey Sunday coat, and make the shoon as black as lace, their hose as white as snow. It's ah to please my own good man, for he's been long the war. The straw at hands upon the bank, been fed this month and mare, may cast and draw the nicks about the coal and wheel may fair. And make the table neat and clean, got ilk a thing look bro. It's a for love of my good man, for he's been long a war. Oh, give me down my big gun, let my bishop sat and gone, for I mun tell the bailies why the colons come to town. My Sunday shoon they mun go on, my house of poor le blue. Tis a to please my own good man, for he's both lale and true. See true his words, his smooth his speech, his breast like collar air, his very foot, his music, and as he comes up the stair. And will I see his face again, and will I hear him speak? I'm downright dizzy with the thought. In truth, I'm like to greet the cold blast or the winter wind that thrilled through my heart. There are blown by, I am safe till death will never part. But what puts parting in my head, it may be far away. The present moment is our aim, the nest we never saw. Since Collins will, I'm will content, I hae no more to crave. Could I but live to mak him blessed, I'm blessed above the lave. And will I see his face again, and will I hear him speak? I'm downright dizzy with the thought, in truth I'm like to greet. For there's nae luck about the house, there's nae luck of all. There's little pleasure in the house, when our good man's a war. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Dulcino to Margaret From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 2 Love, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin Dulcino to Margaret The world goes up and the world goes down And the sunshine follows the rain And yesterday sneer and yesterday's frown can never come over again, sweet wife, no, never come over again. For woman is warm, though man be cold, and the night will hallow the day, till the heart which at even was weary and old can rise in the morning gay, sweet wife, to its work in the morning gay. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. O oh, lay thy hand in mine, dear, by Gerald Massey, 
from the world's best poetry volume two love part two read for librivox dot org by sonia o oh, lay thy hand in mine dear o oh, lay thy hand in mine dear we're growing old but time hath brought no sign dear that hearts grow cold this long long since our new love made life divine but age enriches true love like noble wine and lay thy cheek to mine dear and take thy rest mine arms around thee twine dear and make thy nest a many cares are pressing on this dear head but sorrow's hands in blessing are surely laid o oh, lean thy life on mine dear twill shelter thee thou wert a winsome vine dear on my young tree and so till boughs are leafless and song birds flown will twine then lay as griefless together down end of poem this recording is in the public domain faith and hope by rembrandt peel from the world's best poetry volume two love part two read for librivox dot org by jason in panama faith and hope oh don't be sorrowful darling now don't be sorrowful pray for taking the year together my dear there isn't more night than day it's rainy weather my loved one time's wheels they heavily run but taking the year together my dear there isn't more cloud than sun we're old folks now companion our heads they are growing gray but taking the year all around my dear you will always find the may we've had our may my darling and our roses long ago and the time of the year is come my dear for the long dark nights and the snow but god is god my faithful of night as well as of day and we feel and know that we can go wherever he leads the way ay god of night my darling of the night of death so grim and the gate that from life heads out good wife is the gate that leads to him rembrandt peel end of poem this recording is in the public domain